Good morning, River Terrace. Welcome to the third session of Mary in the Bible and in the world. And I'm going to put up on here on the screen my slides. Okay. And um, so we've been talking about and looking at uh, the person of Mary over these past uh, weeks. The first Sunday of Advent, we looked at Mary in the Bible how scripture portrays her, both with uh, Old Testament prophecy, but more specifically in the Gospels. Then last week, we looked at Mary in history and how her, uh, uh, her ascendancy to being called the mother of God is uh, tied to the recognition that Jesus is both divine and human. And, uh, you know, we talked about uh, people like Constantine and his mother and uh, their role with Mary and then uh, a particular church council. And so this, this uh, today, December 13th, we're looking at Mary in culture, but in many ways it's a continuation of Mary in history. And then next Sunday, the final Sunday of Advent, we'll kind of uh, return to some deeper theological themes, uh, looking at how it all ties together. So I'm glad you're with me today. So we're looking at images of Mary in culture. Uh, today, I'll be drawing from two books in particular, uh, so I won't reference them every time, uh, but, I, but I'm, I'm really relying on them. The first is uh, Mary Rubin's uh, Mother of God, A History of the Virgin Mary, and the other is Yaroslav Pelikan's Mary Through the Centuries, Her Place in the History of Culture. Starting out then, I want to... Um, we're going to be looking at how Mary was portrayed or has been portrayed and understood in different locations and how she is tied to uh, global religion, global empire. And uh, today I'm, I have a, on the, the screen there a picture of the Black Madonna. Now the word Madonna comes from medieval Italian, which uh, meant uh, my lady. And so Madonna, uh, you know, that's a, a name that now is associated with a pop singer. Uh, but the black Madonna of in Poland, Sestachowa. And this image is one that is in Poland. But as I mentioned in the first week, uh, that this icon of Mary, uh, Mary, you see her hand pointing to Jesus. And then Jesus is kind of uh, pointing his hand back to Mary, um, uh, you know, to uh, indicate, you know, this is the vessel through whom, uh, you know, she's the one who's full of grace and the vessel through whom I was brought into the world. Um, <clears throat> this icon is attributed to Luke in, in legend, uh, historical legend. So Luke, if you remember the beginning of his gospel, he says he talked to many eyewitnesses because uh, he wanted to get the story about Jesus right. And so he wrote down uh, the, the story of Jesus. But then if he were what's called an iconographer, icon means image, and uh, iconographers are the ones who write the images. And so in one sense, uh, Luke would have written the, uh, the text, the word of God in the gospel, and then he would have written it as an icon. Uh, however, historians date this to a few centuries later. But the legend goes that Luke, because he sat with Mary, he knew, had met Mary and knew her and interviewed her for his gospel, uh, which I think is probably the case. Uh, but um, there was a, a cedar table that belonged to the Holy Family, you know, Mary, Joseph, and Jesus. And, and uh, Luke used some of that wood upon which to, to paint this portrait of Mary. And... Um, it was hidden then in Jerusalem for 300 years. And then uh, a few centuries down the road after Luke would have painted it, that's when uh, Helena, so if you remember, uh, or Helena, Helena was the mother of Constantine. And after Constantine made Christianity a legal religion, he began to patronize the religion. He didn't make it the official religion, but he began to support it. So he supported missionaries. He's, he convened the Council of Nicaea to determine a doctrinal matter, and he supported or patronized the building of both uh, churches and shrines. And so 
his mother, Helena, went to Jerusalem and she was uh, she led the way for then what became the, the practice of pilgrimages to Jerusalem. And, and so the legend goes, she discovered or was given this icon, brought it back, presented it to her son, Constantine in the early fourth century. And later it made its way to Poland. And there, uh, this icon, the, the um, building that, that held it, uh, was seen as um, what uh, people of that region would pray to and, uh, and they were given protection from invasion. Now, if you do some research online, you'll find you know it looks a little bit strange and that's partly because uh, the icon was repainted because the, the place that it housed it um, was uh, vandalized and robbed. And the icon, the, the part of the wood was broken uh, when they repainted it. it, it uh, the, the two, the original paint, and the new paint didn't really mix, and and so um, it, it looks a little strange. But but it's notable that Mary and Jesus here are are dark, and um, and this is attributed to Luke. Uh, but that's something you could look up if you want to find out more information about that. But but to some degree, there's the Byzantine style with a little bit of with the repainting. There's a bit of a change in uh, her face. And then, um, so you see Mary kind of spreading throughout Europe and it has that imperial connection, at least in the story with Helena to Constantine. And I wanna continue with that imperial theme <clears throat> and, and how Mary is, uh, is tied to the European powers. And there would be so many branches and so many areas to explore, there isn't time. And so I'm gonna focus first on um, Mary with Spain and uh, here you have a portrait of uh, Ferdinand II and Isabella I, and their marriage brought together a unified kingdom of Spain. And, um, and so Isabella was really a strong uh, proponent of Mary. And here, here's um, a, a painting entitled The Virgin of the Catholic Monarchs. And look at this date. So it's, it's sometime between from 1491 to 1493. So keep that date in mind. And it, um, this is from the chapel of the Royal Lodgings at the monastery of Santo Tomas in Avila. And so there you have Mary right in the center holding Jesus, uh, European style clothing from that day. And then uh, you have the, the two monarchs, Ferdinand and Isabella, down below. And off to the side, there's St. Thomas, Thomas Aquinas, uh, the foundational um, uh, theologian of uh, medieval theology, medieval scholasticism. And on the other side is an inquisitor. And uh, the inquisition uh, uh, here was taken up by Ferdinand and Isabella. Um, and we're going to go to the next slide here, because they are associated with, in 1492, at the bottom of, of what we call today Spain, Granada, uh, this was the end of the Reconquista. So the process of uh, a, the Spanish, um, the, the lower end of the Iberian Peninsula, the Spanish driving out the Muslims, the Muslims or the Moors had come over from Africa and uh, had different um, settlements and establishments uh, really uh, had um, were integrated into uh, that that area of land there. And uh, there was a long process of, of what was called reconquering uh, by what had been, you know, uh, the descendants of the um, the tribes that had moved across Europe and the Visigoths, and so they're pushing, uh, pushing the Muslims out and forcing them to uh, both the Muslims and the Jews there to either uh, uh, either convert to Christianity or to leave to be expelled, and so uh, that ended with the uh, down at the the bottom there with Granada. Uh, the Spanish victory, and so the Reconquista was complete. And then Spanish then was Christian or Roman Catholic. But notice that date, 1492, because we also associate it with 
Um, Christopher Columbus, you know, 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue, and uh, Isabella and Ferdinand being the patrons of, uh, you know, uh, sending Columbus on his voyage. And that's the first, you know, if you are, if, if you leave aside, you know, the question of whether the weather and to what degree the Vikings uh, uh, came across and landed in North America, um, that's where Western Europe begins to engage and uh, 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 put an establishment into, uh, <clears throat> into uh, the Americas. I'm going to read from Rubin's book on page 379, uh, where she, she tells how Ferdinand and Isabella, they're joined in marriage in 1469. They brought about the unification of the Iberian Peninsula, where Spain is. It said, uh, Rubin writes that Mary was the personal mentor to the young Isabella. She was depicted on banners as the last Muslim stronghold Granada fell in 1492. Mary is ever present in the altarpiece made for Queen Isabella in the 1490s, a collection of 20 panels. So there you have uh, this connection between Isabella and Mary. Um, I'm going to skip ahead. Uh, it says Marian themes were used to describe Isabella herself. After she delivered her second child, her first male offspring, she was likened to the Virgin Mary who bore a single son and remained chaste for the rest of her life. Like Mary, Isabella nurtured her people and Christians in general through her pursuit of purity. This was the purity of Christian zeal combined with ethnic purity, which resulted in fierce measures that scrutinized the lives of new Christians. And so Reuben is, is showing how Mary then, uh, or sorry, Isabella made use of Mary in her uh, consolidating power over the Spanish uh, region or the Iberian Peninsula and in uh, having the people give their uh, allegiance to her. And so um, I'm gonna, going back to our slides here. <clears throat> So Mary then was key in Isabella and Ferdinand. Part of that, uh, their work was the Reconquista. The other, as I mentioned, uh, was uh, Columbus and his voyage. And then you had the establishment of the Spanish empire abroad. And this could be a, a long lecture or class on itself, although I won't be touching on it. Uh, but, you know, the Spanish were throughout, um, you know, the the lower end of North America, Central America, South America, uh, the Philippines. Um, I visited a Spanish fort when I lived in Taiwan. And part of the legacy of that then is Catholicism throughout the Americas and Catholicism largely of a, a Spanish or in Brazil, Portuguese uh, lineage. And in Mexico then, from uh, around the 1540s, there was a series of apparitions or appearances of Mary in Guadalupe in Mexico. And so now the, the Basilica of Our Lady of Guadalupe is the uh, most visited Catholic site in the world. And the at least eight years ago, uh, when, according to the, the BBC, uh, was the third most religious, the third most uh, visited religious or sacred destination in the world. And, uh, and so you have, uh, just as in Mexico, you have the Spanish language, so too you have uh, Roman Catholicism. And even though Pentecostalism, Protestantism, Evangelicalism has been making inroads throughout uh, Central and uh, South America, um, oftentimes to the, the consternation of not just the um, Roman Catholic leadership there, but, but the Vatican, uh, <clears throat> still this is, this is the culture there. And so this, uh, this image of Our Lady of Guadalupe is both um, well known in Mexico throughout Spanish speaking America, but um, also want to uh, 
oh, here's a, a picture of the uh, pilgrims there and a, a festival there and uh, the devotion given to Mary. And then here, uh, you know, Our Lady of Guadalupe becoming this ubiquitous or global uh, image. And uh, here it is uh, on a um, tattoo on somebody's back. So that is partly the result of the work of Isabella and Ferdinand with their uh, political alliance and their, uh, their pushing out the, the empire, you know, Spain and uh, going abroad and forming an empire. Okay, now we come to another empire or the beginning of an empire. And that's related to the image of Mary uh, and, and actually is related to Isabel and Ferdinand because uh, Isabel and Ferdinand, one of their children was Catherine of Aragorn and she was married to Henry VIII. Henry VIII wanted to have a divorce from her and could not, uh, he wasn't given an annulment by the Pope because that, um, that would displease uh, 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 Isabella and Ferdinand. And so uh, Henry VIII, under the advice of his uh, counselors, he broke off from the Roman Catholic Church. He broke off from England and uh, and then he had uh, one of his daughters, Mary, uh, was very much Catholic. But when, uh, uh, but his other daughter, who lasted longer on the throne, Elizabeth, uh, was the one that cemented uh, England's break from Rome and the establishment of the Anglican Church as what became the you know um, one of the largest uh, branches of Christendom. The Church of England. In fact, I, I grew up in the Episcopal Church, which is the Church of England and um, the United States. And so uh, I'm going to show a clip here from uh, the movie Elizabeth from 1998. Uh, Elizabeth I is played by Kate Blanchett. And, uh, and you'll see here how Elizabeth, in order to rule as a Protestant rule, but cannot totally get rid of the Roman Catholic imagery of, of Mary takes it on for herself. So let's look at this clip. What do I do now? Am I to be made of stone? Must I be touched by nothing? I, madam, to reign supreme. All men need something greater than themselves to look up to and worship. They must be able to touch the divine here on earth. She had such power of men's hearts. They died for her. They have found nothing to replace her. Thank you. 
Observe, Lord Burley. I am married to England. Rubin writes on page 378, despite the attempts to erase the Virgin Mary from the memory of the English, the symbolic deposits were too great to be ignored. And, um, you know, Elizabeth never got married. And so she adopted that, that uh, visage of uh, being like the Virgin Mary. Uh, Rubin writes later on, her person was bedecked in silk and pearls as majestic Mary so often was and the poetry that praised her did so with all the combination of biblical imagery and classical illusion that we have seen the figure of Mary attract. Now, continuing with uh, this theme of imagery and empire, uh, it's important to note then that uh, under Elizabeth during her reign, uh, there was the successful defeat of the Spanish Armada. And uh, so Spain sent up uh, its, its uh, amazing fleet to England to bring it back into the fold of uh, the Roman Catholic community and uh, to make sure the, the, um, the throne of England was Roman Catholic. And with Elizabeth and uh, Francis Drake, whom she made Sir Francis Drake uh, under Drake's leadership and what Protestants often view as providential, uh, you know, weather and, and some poor decisions on the part of the Spanish, uh, a, a much lesser, weaker force defeated the Armada, uh, sent very few ships back compared to what had come to England. And so, uh, so on the one hand, it not only this defeat of the Spanish Armada, not only weakened Spain as a global power, but then freed the seas in a sense for England to gain ascendancy. And, and uh, you know, down the road, England would rival France, you know, who would have the most uh, powerful Navy, especially, you know, around the beginning of the, the 19th century, that rivalry was very intense. But, but the defeat of the Spanish Armada allowed then not only for Protestantism to, uh, to be permanent in, England, but then also to be spread abroad. And so then through the Spanish and Portuguese empires, you had the, the spread of Roman Catholicism and through the British and Dutch empires, uh, the, the spread of Protestantism. Uh, if we had more time, I would talk about how um, uh, France uh, also, you know, was, had its own empire and and we, we live with the legacy of that here in Michigan with, uh, you have uh, Marquette who uh, came through Michigan, actually died on, in, in uh, just off the coast of Michigan in Lake, on Lake Michigan, or sorry, he was brought off the, brought from the uh, lake onto the coast and, and died uh, near Ludington. And, um, and even in his uh, missionary work, uh, the, the image of Mary figured very prominently. And so that is part of uh, Roman Catholic mission, French imperial uh, work. And so Mary ties into that as well. But so uh, whereas England became Protestant, Elizabeth took up the imagery of being the Virgin Queen in place of the Virgin Mary. 
and then throughout the uh, you know the 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 um, Spanish and Portuguese empires, uh, you know, 15th, 16th centuries, and then the uh, the 18th and 19th centuries, the, the Western European empires, we had the spread of global Christianity. And so you see here different representations of Mary, the mother and child. And I remember when we first moved to Taiwan, I went to a Roman Catholic bookstore. It was in Taipei. It was a um, Chinese but Roman Catholic. And I found these these cards, the Christmas cards, and I was like, "Oh, this is great!" And it had uh, pictures similar to these ones on the right, uh, the Chinese Madonna and Child, and um, sent those home to our family. And and that's where you see the process of contextualization. Uh, you know, the the religion spreads to a new country or new community. And so, on the one hand, many things are passed down, like this is Mary, the mother giving birth to the Son of God, but then uh, the clothing, the style, the painting, the, the color choices, they're more local. And so we see that global representation. Also, um, Mary is uh, present in our culture today, uh, partly through cinema. And I'm going to show two clips here of films. The first comes from uh, Franco Zeffirelli's 1977 miniseries. I remember I was uh, young when this was on TV and uh, played in reruns. Um, and uh, I think because it was Christian, you know, a portrayal of Jesus, it, it let my it let, my parents let me stay up late to watch it. But um, in this clip of Mary with the Annunciation, we have the English actress Olivia Hussey, and just as Jesus on this movie poster, you'll see that uh, Olivia Hussey, uh, who um, was um, both Argentine and, and English, uh, she she has the blue eyes, like the blue eyes of Jesus here. So let's look at this clip. How can that be? No man has ever touched me. In contrast to that very Western European portrayal of, of Mary and the miniseries Jesus of Nazareth, now we're going to look at a more recent portrayal, and that is the 2006 film, The Nativity Story. And in this, Mary is portrayed by a teenage actress, Keisha Castle Hughes, who's Australian, New Zealand background, and she herself uh, is a mix of uh, Maori, uh, an indigenous people group of New Zealand, and then um, Anglo-Australian. And so in that sense, she, like many of us in the world, is a, is a product, a legacy of, of uh, the British Empire. And uh, even though she is not herself Jewish of Jewish descent or Middle Eastern descent, her complexion, her eye and hair color uh, make her look like she could uh, fit into the 
Middle East. And so I, I think that's why she was chosen. Also, she was best known for her uh, being the lead actress in um, Whale Rider, a, a movie about uh, life in New Zealand. And so now let's take a look at this clip. Is with you. Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Come, you will conceive in your womb and give birth to a son, and you will call his name Jesus. How can this be, since I've been with no man? The Holy Spirit will come upon you. And the power from the Most High will overshadow you. And the Holy Offspring shall be called the Son of God. Son of God. Mary, even your cousin Elizabeth has conceived a son in her old age. For nothing said by God can be impossible. Let it be done to me, according to your word. Just an interesting note. I remember when that film premiered, The Nativity Story, and it actually had its premiere held at the Vatican, the first time that ever happened with the movie. And there was a bit of a scandal because the, the lead actress uh, herself was a young teenager, uh, unmarried, and it turned out she was pregnant. So, uh, I, so I don't recall whether she herself, I, I think she was uninvited to the event. And even um, the Pope at the time, Pope Benedict XVI, although his spokespeople said he was away on Turkey in business in the press. It was, uh, it was wondered whether he he didn't come because of that issue. But it was just interesting to have that contrast of the scandal over a young, unmarried, pregnant woman. Um, you know, situations between the actress and Mary very different, but still it was a um, just a an interesting uh, part of the rollout of that film. So here is an attempt to uh, portray Mary one with Jesus of Nazareth in the classic European style, the nativity story, trying to get more back to the uh, first century and um, portray Mary that way. But now I want to look at another um, uh, indication or uh, symbol of, of, of how ubiquitous Mary is. Now um, with Madonna, I mentioned earlier that the name or the title Madonna means my lady. And, um, and so I remember when I was uh, uh, a preteen in the early 1980s and the singer who'd been born in Michigan uh, came out, was uh, part of the, the rise of MTV, uh, called herself Madonna, how that was shocking. And then her second album uh, came out with um, Like a Virgin. And, uh, and so this is an inversion of Mary. And instead of being 
the the chaste young woman uh you know is very uh, risque and kind of in your face and and i remember being at cedar point one summer and in line for a ride and and just how there were these uh teenage girls uh waiting in line and they were all dressed like madonna with the the bracelets and and kind of the the style that she dresses in so on the left um that's from her uh 1984 like a virgin and then on on the right uh madonna shocked again not just in using the title madonna but then um she had an album and a song entitled like a prayer and the video came out and uh and uh pepsi originally was a sponsor of her tour but I, but they pulled out because um especially roman catholics a number of people but roman catholics really protested because you know uh there was uh there's a scene in the music video where she uh has a dagger and then she holds her hands out like she has the stigmata you know the, the signs of jesus um she's dressed uh you know kind of uh scantily clad and and has burning crosses behind her but madonna then uh really was able to tap into that me cultural memory of Mary, but invert it and make herself kind of the anti-Mary in a sense. And so um, so that's one way that the, the image of Mary carries on, even if it's uh, kind of the, the opposite here. And so we've seen then uh, today, Mary being tied to the rise of imperial powers uh, and and whether she is promoted formally in a religious way with Spain or uh, or used by Elizabeth to basically you know found the the British Empire and it's uh, the British Royal Navy which would allow the the British Empire to grow uh, throughout the world um, and, and then as Mary along with the Bible and Jesus and uh, whether it be Protestantism or Catholicism as it goes out and as she goes out into the world, she's adapted to local cultures and becomes part of the cultural memory. And in new forms of uh, visual portrayal, music videos, movies, uh, she's portrayed uh, in, um, in different ways. And so today then our, our focus is not um, so much on scripture, but rather on visual representation and history. And so next week, I'm going to kind of be returning to scripture and trying to bring it all together, look at the deeper theological themes about Mary and the Nativity event. So I hope to see you then. And just as for today's class, I pre-recorded it because I'm leading, leading the musical part of worship in our service. Um, so too, next week will be pre-recorded, but debuting online at the same time.